Hey everyone, Cynthia here with The Nameless Homestead and today we are putting on our work shoes and actually going outside for this video. In last week's video, which I will put a tag to in uh, the top here somewhere, it was about using heat lamps and how unsafe they are in almost every situation. So do check that video out. For this week, we're gonna be talking about what you actually can do to keep your animals warm and safe and comfortable this winter so you don't have to rely on something as dangerous as heat lamps. Keeping animals warm in the winter can be really challenging. Right now, we're having a wonderful little heat wave here in the inland Northwest. It even got up to 40 degrees this past week, which has been wonderful. But we are unfortunately expecting another dip into some very frigid temperatures. Oftentimes out here, we'll get into the negative digits, quite below into the negative digits, in fact. So in this video, we're going to go over several ways that you can achieve comfortable warm animals through even the more frigid temperatures. First things first, let's discuss basic housing. This is going to be your first line of defense against the cold winter weather. Depending on your region, this could look like a simple three wall structure uh, that your animals can just use as a windbreak. But for a lot of places, you're going to need more than that. I do strongly recommend four solid wood walls, a solid, sturdy, leak-free wood roof, and a locking door. This not only helps your animals against the cold, but also against predation. This is my chicken coop. As you can see, it's not the prettiest or fanciest chicken coop there ever was, but what it is, is very sturdy. Another hot tip for people who are building a structure for their chickens, or really for any livestock in general, if you can place it so that's generally south facing and if you can put in little plexiglass windows somewhere along that south facing wall you will get a nice greenhouse effect that can really take the nip out of the air for your animals but regardless of what style of structure that you use there are a few key elements here that do remain the same you want to make sure that your structure is draft free but has good ventilation and i know that at first that might seem like contradictory but let me show you the difference this area here in the side of my chicken coop is a problem. This is something that I need to fix with a few new boards of trim as it's been a few years and a piece came off. This creates a draft. Wind can go through into this chicken coop and uh, make it quite chilly for your animals with that blowing breeze. This is an example of draft. This is an example of ventilation. Ventilation is for reducing the level of moisture inside your structure, whether this is a chicken coop or even a full-size barn for larger livestock, putting some sort of ventilation, even if it's just a few holes drilled in the top corner, I've seen plenty of people do that, or if it's a cheap vent cover that you would put in any house that you can pick up at a place like Lowe's, Home Depot, any home goods store. If you have venting, you can greatly reduce the amount of moisture in your structure and you can greatly increase the level of comfort for your animals. Another really, really common mistake, especially for beginners, is keeping waterers inside the chicken coop. That definitely does dramatically increase the humidity in the space. So if you do have your waterers inside your chicken coop, take them out. Your chickens do not need water overnight. They don't need food overnight either. So you do not need to have feeders and waterers inside the chicken coop. Uh, that just causes more problems down the road with pests and of course, humidity issues. Now let's talk deep bedding. So what do I mean by deep bedding? Deep bedding is the concept of adding bedding to your animal's stall over layers of manure so that you can create a compost effect to help keep your animals warm. Walking over to the barn now so I can show you what I mean as we just reset our bedding. If you guys follow me on Instagram, you might have seen my uh, photo montage of me using a mattock to dig out the deep bedding as it had gotten carried away and got it built up when my husband had COVID and life was a little crazy. But this concept of deep bedding and essentially having your animals sleep on a compost pile, as gross as it might sound to us, is actually a fantastic way to naturally keep your animals nice and warm and cozy and get a kickstart on your gardening. Hi everybody, how are we doing this morning? Hey, oh mama Piper, hello. There's Puck, hi. The famous little naughty man. Yeah, don't knock me over again, you twerp. Okay, so deep bedding. Let's come in the barn and check it out. Until we expand the barn, which hopefully we'll be doing this spring, we have these two stalls. Uh, Penny and Piper go in the one on the left. And 
page and one of our little weathers chaos goes in the one on the right. We put a significant amount of straw in the bedding and now keep in mind you want straw, not hay, um, because straw has got these nice thick hollow stems, which of course helps with um, an air buffer to keep them warm. But we put down a significant deep layer of bedding, of straw. You can also use minerals like PDZ in the straw bedding to keep the ammonia down and absorb the moisture. Or lime, agricultural lime is also a great thing to put down as a base. But primarily what you want to be using is straw. So after we put down a nice thick layer of straw, we allow the animals to have a little bit of manure buildup, not significantly, you don't want them sitting in a puddle of poo, but then we mix it together and then you add more straw on top. It's the same as building a compost pile. The straw is your browns, the manure is your greens, you mix it, it starts to break down. That breakdown process is a chemical reaction that creates warmth, which helps your animals. Hi, you pests. You're very much a pest. We're trying to record for YouTube. I'm trying to be professional. <sighs> Sorry guys, I try, but they don't make it easy. So anyway, you do that. And then in the spring, you can dig it out and the compost is ready to go straight into your garden. And I am not a very good gardener. The only thing that keeps my plants growing and thriving is this compost. I promise I know I have some friends who are very good gardeners who have uh, taught me all about that. Or if you want to be super lazy like me, you can just layer it lasagna style. Turning it will help it to break down faster and to produce more heat, but I often just put a new stack of straw on top of the dirty bedding and we just add to that and it piles up. Uh, when, it got, when life got a little bit crazy and we had COVID and I didn't get to clean it out, we had to get to uh, probably about a foot deep, yeah, about to the second rung here of bedding before we cleaned it out. So that was a bit deep for us because if you let it go too long and pile up too deep, it does become kind of a nightmare to clean out. If you live in a more mild climate, one thing that is uh, a really great thing to do to keep the humidity and the moisture down even more is to use coarse ground sand in your coops or in your stalls and then you can scoop it like kitty litter to keep it clean. However, that's not a, usually a great option for equine because they can colic from ingestion of sand. Uh, but for some people, especially with goats and various types of poultry, it's a great option when they live in a warmer yet more humid environment and trying to dance to keep away from puck. You're such a nuisance. Such, oh my goodness, this, what is this video? It is a mess. All right, so this is arguably the most important aspect of this entire conversation, and that is understanding how animals naturally ward off the cold by their own biological abilities. Mammals like goats and horses, for example, have this natural ability to raise the hair on their bodies and become these little fluff balls. You'll see this remnant in humans actually with us getting goosebumps and the hair on our arms rising. And basically what this does for those thick coated animals in their warm fluffy winter coats is it creates an air buffer. They trap air in between all the hairs on their body, these little bubbles of air, which then they warm with their body heat and it acts is a warm air bubble or cushion all around their bodies to keep them warm. This is why it's important to keep them out of wind and keep them out of wet primarily, because if there's wind blowing on them, that of course disrupts their ability to hold those little bubbles of air close to their bodies. And if they're wet, that also of course makes it a lot more difficult to do that. Poultry do the exact same thing, but with their feathers. If you've ever seen a chicken or a turkey or any bird go to bed at night, you'll see them fluff up their bodies, tuck their bases in behind their wings, maybe raise one leg up, maybe have both feet down, but sit over them so that the feathers cover their feet. And when they're doing that, they're doing it because they've trapped this air from the room that they're in and they hunker down with it. They allow their body heat to warm that air and then they trap that air around their body like a warm blanket for the night. This is the reason why those drafts come in and tend to make a space so much colder because if the wind is going at all, even the light breezes, when they disrupt the feathers or they disrupt the fur, it kind of is like pulling the blanket off them at night. 
And speaking of blankets, it's a fantastic segue. Blanketing our animals or putting sweaters on them as adorable as goats and sweaters are, often do more harm than good because what that does is the pressure of the blanket or the sweater that we've put on them means so they cannot uh, adequately puff up and fluff up those hairs because that blanket or that goat coat is compressing it. Now this, of course, there is an exception for elderly or sick animals who don't have thick coats, are um, recovering from maybe their rescue and they've been starved, all of those situations notwithstanding. But most healthy animals of good condition uh, will be colder for putting a coat or a blanket on them than without it because it interferes with their natural process. But what about baby animals? Those are a different story altogether. One of the best ways to do that, of course, is to plan your breedings and keep your males separated from your females when you don't want them to be bred. But in smaller homesteads like mine, for example, space is uh, an issue. We only have six acres and we don't wanna have a bunch of males to keep our buck company. So we prefer to keep our animals together. I mitigate that by keeping an eye on when the girls come into heat, checking bottoms for the remnants of lovemaking during their heat cycles. And uh, a lot of people will use chalk harnesses so that they will have their herds that are much larger and harder to check those things. Uh, their girls will be marked when they're bred or they will use buck aprons. I'll put a picture of one of those here because that might be a bit confusing for those who don't know. It was for me, which is a physical barrier against breeding. When your male goes to mount your female, it is between them and therefore disallows the breeding to take place. By using these various tools, you can control when your girls conceive and that way you're also controlling when they give birth. So you can plan to have things like a barn cam in place or um, just which season they end up giving birth in that's not so bitter, so you're less likely to have problems when they're giving birth and have wet new babies on the ground. When the birthing actually begins to take place, the best things that you can do are have things like a hair dryer if you have electricity in your barn and or old cloth diapers because the most important thing you can do to keep from having frozen babies on the ground is by getting them as dry as possible, as quickly as possible. Babies, once they're dry and they have a full tummy of milk and they're snuggled down in deep bedding with their mama and their siblings, will do just fine keeping warm in a draft-free barn environment. They won't need anything extra if you've done all of those other little steps ahead of time. Chicks, of course, are an entirely different story. If you hatch smaller batches like I do, uh, batches of like, let's say 30 or fewer at a time inside a controlled heat environment, like inside my home, I have a little brooder box that I use. A lot of people will use old play pens. I've been known to use my garden tub when I had larger hatches. Yeah, it might sound like a little bit ghetto, but tell me which homesteader hasn't done that. Uh, so if you can, keep it in a more controlled environment, you can use radiant heat brooders. I will again link to uh, the product that I'm discussing. Of course, none of these are affiliate links so that you guys can check them out. And basically what that does is it keeps them just warm enough under this little warming plate where they hunker in, get warm and go ahead and, and pop out. But unfortunately they don't work below a certain temperature. The environment already has to I believe be around 50 or 60 degrees as a baseline in order for that to function appropriately. But if you do have do smaller hatches like that, those do work really well. Now, if you do bigger hatches of chicks, you're probably not going to be able to get away from using some kind of heat lamp. However, if you do use a heat lamp, use a Premier One heat lamp. Don't use those little silver ones. Uh, and even when using the Premier One heat lamp, which has a better, safer housing for the bulb, make sure that you're mounting it very, very securely, that you have it as high as possible off of the bedding and away from the animals while still getting the temperature that you need and that it's securely mounted. Especially once poultry begin to fly, they can knock into those heat lamps and the clamps that they come with, uh, factory specification, can become knocked loose very, very easily. Another thing to keep in mind when you do have to use the heat lamp is to check for dust on the bulb. Heat lamps have been known to ignite the dust 
that accumulates on the bulb. And if anyone's ever raised poultry before, uh, you'll know that they produce bird dust at significant rates. That adds up pretty quick, like over a day or two. It's not about days, weeks, and months of neglect and not checking it. That can add up pretty dang quick. I hope you all enjoyed our video today. Hit the like button if you did. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell if you'd like to see more videos like these. I hope that some of this information helped you guys to keep your animals safe and warm this winter. See you all next Sunday.